and 10. We begin today with the Easter acclamation in the speech of Pentecost. Hallelujah! Christ is risen! The Lord is risen indeed! Hallelujah! Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, 
saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We will read in unison portions of Psalm 104, beginning and ending with the refrain. O Lord, how manifold are your works. O Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Yonder is the great and wide sea, with its living things too many to number, creatures both great and small. There move the ships, and there is the Leviathan, which you have made for the sport of it. All of them look to you to give them their food in due season. You give it to them, they gather it. You open your hand, and they are filled with good things. You hide your face, and they are terrified. You take away their breath, and they die and return to their dust. You send forth your spirit, and they are created. And so you renew the face of the earth. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in all his works. He looks at the earth and it trembles. He touches the mountains and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will praise my God while I have my being. May these words of mine please him. I will rejoice in the Lord. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Alleluia. O Lord, how manifold are your works. A reading from Paul's letter to the Romans. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we are saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is in the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said, When the Advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth who comes from the Father, he will testify on my behalf. You also are to testify because you have been with me from the beginning. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you, but now I am going to him who sent me. Yet none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your hearts. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will prove the world wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment about sin because they do not believe in me, about righteousness because I am going to the Father and you will see me no longer, about judgment because the ruler of this world has been condemned. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. and speak through them. Take our minds and think through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire with your love. Amen. Amen. We are in a time of transition. Transition in terms of our worship. It's really nice to see bunch of people sitting in a very small space. I'm not sure y'all like it as much, but it looks great from up here. And although the blurb at the top of the bulletin hasn't yet been changed, it will be. And in case you missed it, you can sing. And that's important. It's important because singing is, well, as one said, praying twice, but it's also important because it is one of those ways that we gather together and we create something greater than the sum of our individual parts and selves. Have you ever bought something that said on the outside of the box, some assembly required? For me, the experience goes something like this. Because I'm looking forward to enjoying the thing I bought once it's all put together, I'm pretty eager to get started as soon as I get it in the house. And if it's something small enough, I may even try to get Sonia to drive home so that I can at least start reading the instructions before we even get there. Now, although it may be hard to believe for some of you, I'm pretty organized and linear when it comes to such projects. It's okay, you can laugh. <laughs> Unlike the stereotype of old school men, I actually do start with the instructions. Laying out all the parts, making sure everything I need is in the box, because that hasn't always been the case, and gathering the tools I think I'll need, because I really don't like those wimpy ones that might come in the box. I have real tools. But the instructions themselves aren't always a great help. 
Sometimes it's hard to find the English version of the directions in the middle of the 15 other languages that the supplier believes somebody might be able to read. And sometimes that English version is obviously a computer-produced translation from the original Swedish or Mandarin or German and barely makes any sense. And these so-called easy step-by-step -step instructions then attempt to show how to put together a three-dimensional object with two-dimensional line drawings, with lots of dotted lines aiming those teeny tiny bolts and washers and nuts through even smaller holes in the large awkward pieces I'm trying to hold with my hands, my knees, the wall, or whatever else I can find. Now sometimes the holes in the various pieces don't line up quite right, and I might have to grab a drill to correct the problem, putting sawdust or metal shavings on the floor that I'll have to clean up later. Sometimes two pieces look exactly alike, or almost, and I invariably choose the wrong one the first time around, which forces me to take something apart I thought I had put together correctly. I have to admit that sometimes I feel like giving up. Why did I, or worse yet, Sonia, order this thing and assume it would go together without a hitch? Who said that I would have the knowledge or the skill or the time or the confidence to get this project completed? Have you ever thought about what the disciples of Jesus did after he left them to return to his father, what we call his ascension? He told them to stay there together in Jerusalem, where pretty much none of them actually lived, until they were clothed with power from on high, whatever he meant by that, or until the advocate, the spirit of truth, came to them, whoever or whatever that was. But they did know one thing, because he had said it to them many times, he had given them a task once that happened, to go into the world, the whole world, mind you, telling about the good news of the resurrection, baptizing those who believed what they were saying. They were to be witnesses in everything that they had seen and heard from Jesus, including how he had been arrested, tortured, and killed by a collusion of the leaders of their religion and the Romans who were occupying their land. A risky and dangerous business, being a witness. No wonder the Greek word for witness is the word martyr, which many of them became. But somehow this motley crew of mostly uneducated men and women who in that society had very little respect, voice, or certainly power, was to become a new race that welcomed all races and languages, a new family that welcomed rich and poor, male and female, a new nation that welcomed both Jews and non-Jewish Gentiles. All of the human barriers to community were to be set aside in favor of loving as Jesus had demonstrated it. So what did they do? We don't know much, but we do know something we heard last week. They took a baby step toward organization. They held an election. They filled the empty seat on the vestry with Matthias. But other than that one action, we don't really know what they talked about. The treasurer had committed suicide, so obviously the books were a mess. Certainly somebody pointed out that there was no way they could afford to go into the whole world. Somebody else may have named the obvious fact that it was dangerous to go out in public among strangers, even if they could figure out how to speak to them, how to serve them, how to love them. And what had made Jesus think that they would be any good at evangelism anyway? No, we don't know what they talked about in those days of waiting, whether they tried to make any plans for how they would do what Jesus had told them to do, to tell the people this amazing inside story 
of what Jesus had done, the things he had taught them, and most of all, how he had showed them how God loves by how he loved them and everyone else he met. But what we do know is this, they were joyful. Even though they couldn't predict how everything would turn out, how this thing would be put together, they knew that they were blessed to be a part of God's plan for drawing all people to the divine. And we know that they did stay together, breaking the bread and sharing the wine as Jesus had told them to do. And we know, perhaps most importantly, that they were constantly in prayer. They knew that they didn't know exactly what to do or how to do it. The instructions were far from clear. And so they followed the example of Jesus and lifted their hearts, minds, spirits, and voices to God, listening for divine guidance as he had. Even as we sing and pray, speak, Lord, I'm listening. And then something extraordinary happened on the feast we celebrate today. They were all attacked, for lack of a better word, by what seemed to be wind and fire, two of the ancient symbols of God's presence. That energy, that being set on fire with confidence, drove them out into the street, among strangers from everywhere, sharing their stories of what God had done through Jesus. They were so out of control with joy and excitement that they were accused of being drunk at nine o'clock in the morning. All their fears and doubts, all those very reasonable objections to Jesus' command to love and serve and share their stories simply evaporated. And so the church, the body of Christ, was on the move. And that's how the church was and is intended to be, on the move. It was never intended to stay within walls, even the walls of lovely historic spaces filled with red balloons and even redder clothing. <laughs> it was intended for the street, for the people, for places everywhere. This Holy Spirit wasn't given so that people of like minds, like races or ethnicities, like economic classes, or like political opinions could gather together. There are plenty of organizations made up of folks who have these characteristics in common. And it can feel more comfortable, less awkward, just plain easier to make our congregations look and act that way too. But the Holy Spirit was given to the church to enable it to be the church, to put things together that may look or feel at first like they don't fit by doing whatever it takes to build a beloved community centered around the one who said that when he was lifted up on the cross, he would draw the whole world with all its complexity and diversity to himself. Today is my final day as the priest in charge of St. James' House of Prayer. I am grateful for the welcome, the love, and the respect I have felt from so many of you. Even when, at times, and I'll take all of this on myself, we didn't completely understand each other's history, culture, or perspective on various things. While I regret that I wasn't able to form closer relationships with you in worship, teaching, community service, and pastoral care, I am grateful that God allowed me to use some knowledge and talents and to develop others so that we could continue to praise and pray to God even when we couldn't gather physically to do so. And so that some of the work of the church at least could go on. It was, I will admit, a challenge each week 
to open a box with a bunch of computer, fi computer files containing songs, readings, prayers, and whatever other pieces might be rolling around in the bottom of the box, and assemble something that could bring glory to God, not only for many of our current members, but for others beyond our walls as well. And it has been at times a challenge, although always a great privilege, to encourage the leadership of this unique fellowship to see the campus here at Central and Columbus as the headquarters of a congregation on the move. Unfortunately, the Holy Spirit doesn't guarantee that the decisions we have made together or the ones you will make going forward are always the most effective ones. Sometimes we stumble on our way to God. But as Paul wrote to the Christians at Rome in the verse that appears at the bottom of every email that I send, we know that all things work for good with those who love God, who are called according to God's purpose. The only things that God cannot easily work for good are apathy and fearfulness, which end up with the same result in action. Those first disciples had to care enough about Jesus and his message to want to share it. And they had to overcome their fears of failure, discomfort, or worse, in order to leave the locked rooms and spread the gospel of love throughout the world as they knew it. In last week's gospel, you may remember, Jesus prayed for his disciples on the night before he died, that they would be protected, that they would find unity in love, not in sameness, and that they would allow God to sanctify them, to set them apart, to do great and special acts of loving service. Today we hear that they were constantly in prayer themselves, and my guess is that they prayed for much the same things. And so, as I conclude my ministry among you today, I ask for your prayers, even as I promise to continue my prayers for you. Thank you. 
for all of those who are homeless, especially those who suffer from mental illness and substance abuse. For our work in the Hope Organization. Gifts of ministering to our 
our sick and shut ins and for preparing me to continue to serve our parish in the upcoming months. We thank you, Lord. For Steve's remarkable gift of shepherding our church family and our corporate worship through the worst months of this COVID 19 pandemic, from moving services into his home and probably learning more about using Facebook, YouTube, Zoom, and video technologies than he ever wanted to, and to safely bringing worship back into our church building, following social distancing, face masking, and other requirements, all simultaneously maintaining online worship and virtual coffee hours. For Steve's family, including his wife, the Reverend Sonia Sullivan Clifton, and their two children, Christopher and Catherine, and his grandson, George, and other family members, friends, and siblings in Christ here in this church, our diocese, the Diocese of Central Florida, and throughout the nation. We thank you, Lord. And especially now, for this new season in Steve's ministry, as he moves back to his home in the Diocese of Georgia, where you are already preparing him for the new position to which you will call him. And for Steve, as he supports Reverend Sonia in her new position as chaplain of Episcopal Day School in Augusta, Florida. And for letting Steve know as he leaves us that he goes with our deep felt love, gratitude, and best wishes. Thank you, Lord. And for our resilient church family here at St. James House of Prayer, as we be begin to enter yet another new season in the life of our church, that we will always know that we are companions on this journey as you prepare us to discover the new priest whom you also have already chosen for us. And in this time of transition, for the guidance and patience that you will give our senior warden, Leela, and our junior warden, Carla, the vestry, the worship and programming committee, and all the faithful members of St. James House of Prayer. We thank you, Lord. And we pray, Lord, that you will continue to draw Steve's heart to you, and that you will guide Steve's mind and fill his imagination and control his will so that he will be wholly yours, utterly dedicated unto you, and then use him as you will, and always to your glory and the welfare of your people through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And now we pray together for Steve and for one another. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.
be more announcements for the good of our parish family later in the service. For right now, please allow me to offer welcome to all who are here today, to all who are joining us for worship online, and even for all who will worship with us after this time uh, as, as we continue to, uh, to post our videos so that people can use them as aids in their worship in time to come. Through Christ, let us continually offer to God the sacrifice of praise that is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. But do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. He's going to give it to us.
All things come of thee, O Lord, and of thine own have we given thee. Amen. We continue today with Eucharistic Prayer D, prayer we don't use very often. It is the most ancient of the Eucharistic prayers, and it is, I believe, especially fitting for the day of Pentecost as it uh, explains most fully, if you will, or uh, at least just tries to describe most fully the role of the Spirit in the church and in our lives. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is truly right to glorify you, Father, and to give you thanks. For you alone are God, living and true, dwelling in light inaccessible from before time and forever. Fountain of life and source of all goodness, you made all things and filled them with your blessing. You created them to rejoice in the splendor of your radiance. Countless throngs of angels stand before you to serve you night and day, and beholding the glory of your presence, they offer you unceasing praise. Joining with them and giving voice to every creature under heaven, we acclaim you and glorify your name as we sing. seeking you, we might find you. Again and again, you called us into covenant with you, and through the prophets, you taught us to hope for salvation. Father, you love the world so much that in the fullness of time, you sent your only Son to be our Savior. Incarnate by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, he lived as one of us, yet without sin. To the poor, he proclaimed the good news of salvation. To prisoners, freedom. To the sorrowful joy. To fulfill your purpose, he gave himself up to death, and rising from the grave, destroyed death, and made the whole creation new. And that we might live no longer for ourselves, but for him who died and rose for us, he sent the Holy Spirit, his own first gift for those who believe, to complete his work in the world, and to bring to fulfillment the sanctification of all. When the hour had come for him to be glorified by you, his heavenly Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. At supper with them, he took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Father, we now celebrate this memorial of our redemption recalling Christ's death and his descent among the dead, proclaiming his resurrection and ascension to your right hand, awaiting his coming in glory, and offering to you from the gifts you have given us this bread and this cup, we praise you and we bless you. We praise you, we bless you, we give thanks to you, and we pray to you, Lord our God. Lord, we pray that in your goodness and mercy, your Holy Spirit may descend upon us and upon these gifts, sanctifying them and showing them to be holy gifts for your holy people, 
the bread of life and the cup of salvation, the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Grant that all who share this bread and cup may become one body and one spirit, a living sacrifice in Christ to the praise of your name. Remember, Lord, your one holy Catholic and apostolic church, redeemed by the blood of your Christ. Reveal its unity, guard its faith, and preserve it in peace. Remember, Daphne, our bishop, the people of St. James House of Prayer Episcopal Church, and all who minister in your church. And grant that we may find our inheritance with the Blessed Virgin Mary, with patriarchs, prophets, apostles, and martyrs, with St. James and all the saints who have found favor with you in ages past. We praise you in union with them and give you glory through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, all honor and glory are yours, Almighty God and Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to sing.
Please stand. Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Be seated, please, for just a moment. <coughs> I do not know of many announcements at this moment. Just know that as things continue to evolve in terms of CDC guidelines relative to the pandemic and Bishop Smith's guidelines relative to the same, um, that things could continue to uh, move in uh, different directions. Uh, we pray that those directions will, A, uh, continue to be ways that we can remain safe and keep each other safe because that is still the top priority, and B, that it will allow uh, worship in and in fuller senses, much like today. And so I want to give thanks to, um, to Julius for being back on the bench and being our director of contemporary music, uh, and also to Linnea Norsworthy, who could not be here today. She was uh, very regretful, but she had a prior commitment. Uh, of course, the beautiful prelude and postlude um, are, are recordings from her. Senior Warden, do you have any announcements? Yes, sir. I do. Father, you, you will stay. 
stay down here with us. We appreciate it. Cool. You're part of the announcement. <laughs> On behalf of the Congregation of St. James House of Prayer, we present you with this token of our love and appreciation for all you've accomplished uh, while you've been our priest in charge here at St. James House of Prayer. And we appreciate all of the wonderful things you were able to accomplish in 22 short months. I remind you that you could have stayed a little longer. But <laughs> <laughs> he, was not willing to, he was not willing to commute from Augusta, Georgia to be with us. So, uh, <laughs> the members of the congregation were so kind and, and sent such um, generous gifts. And I thought, good, you won't have to carry one more thing as you go uh, out of the state of Florida. And here is a basket of Ooh. cards that you can read at your leisure, that we're hoping that these words of encouragement and these words of appreciation will give you joy and comfort in your leisure time, because I'm sure you'll have plenty. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, we, uh, we are preparing your picture for the memorial wall. Just know that, you know, I threatened Father Steve to pull one from Facebook if he didn't send me one, so he did send me one. And, and it is already ordered and paid for, but it takes about two weeks to get done because you didn't want me to frame and bat it. That's not the other thing. Send me a picture. Oh, you know, I was thinking of that myself. <laughs> <laughs> we will miss you. And, you know, we want you on the memorial wall because you will be a continuing part of our history. And we appreciate all of your hard work and all the challenges you met, especially from the senior warden. Uh, I just want you to know that, that I enjoyed working with you and I hope you have a wonderful adjustment in Georgia and the congregation since all of their lovely you to the beginning. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So between that beautiful litany and the senior warden's remarks, and my guess is what is contained in those cards and perhaps in this one as well, um, probably everything that needs to be said has been said. Having said that, <laughs> just know that that it has been a joy and a blessing. And my prayer is that you will continue to move forward in the spirit, that you will continue to go out into the world as a congregation on the move, and that you will never be content with the way things are. We are not intended to be content with the way things are in this world. And so my prayer is that however much happiness and joy you find here week to week, month to month, year to year, that there's always an itch, always a desire to be more in Christ and to do more for Christ. And so I just look forward, thanks to technology, to continuing to see you, hear you, follow the work that God will give you to do, and give thanks as you continue to do it. Maisie asked me to announce that at the end of the service, for those who would like to stick around for a moment, there are plans for a photograph. Pentecost is a great day for a photograph, after all. So there being no other announcements for the good of our parish family, please stand for the blessing.
My friends, life is short. And there's not too much time for us to gladden the hearts of those who walk the journey of life with us. So make haste to love. Be swift to be kind. And may the one who journeys with us, the one who loves each and all of us more than we could ever ask or imagine, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless you and all of us as we continue that journey in faith, both now and evermore. Amen. Amen.